Um, King Lear, Act 4, Scene 4. Don't tell Madeline anything I just said, because she came in late. So I heard it in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the door next time. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you hear the stairwell, like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> okay, so Act 4, Scene 4. Cordelia comes back in. Um, everything out of my pockets. And she says, Alack, tis he, why he was mad even now, as mad as the vexed sea, singing aloud, crowned with a rank fumator, thick climbing vine, now known as fumatory. You're all familiar with fumatory, I'm sure, that thick climbing vine. <laughs> a lot of good that really does, you know. And furrow weeds with hardocks, hemlock, nettles, cuckoo flowers, darnel. In other words, it's like he is covered with weeds. Okay? And when she says crowned with, she probably means that he literally has woven like a crown of vines and stuff and is wearing it. That's symbolic of he's lost his reason. Okay? So the gentleman says, when um, Cordelia asks, what can man's wisdom in the restoring his bereaved sense? In other words, what does man know that can restore Lear's sense, his awareness of self and such? Gentlemen, well, there is means, madam. Our foster nurse of nature is repose. What does that mean? Our foster nurse of nature. How does nature help bring about healing? He is saying. To people who are ill. They rest. They rest. Just a good long rest. Okay. The which he lacks. Well, why does he lack rest? Are we talking mere physical rest? Putting your head down on a pillow and going to sleep. No. What other kind of rest does he lack? What kind of peace? Mental. Mental. Inner peace. He lacks inner peace. He's all in a turmoil. Okay? And so he says, we can do that. We can help bring this repose with many simples operative. That is, medicinal plants, whose power will close the eye of anguish. So, Cordelia, all blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth, spring with my tears. Spring, grow, be luxuriant. Okay? She's saying, my tears will water the earth. Let it produce what is needed for her father. All right? Skip a little bit. Skip all of Act 4, Scene 5, for example. All 40 lines of it. Um, and go on to Act 4, Scene 6. We now have Gloucester and Edgar. Just yell down the hallway. Um, you now have Gloucester and Edgar. And... Gloucester says, when shall I come to the top of that same hill? And Edgar says, you're climbing it now. Okay, now keep in mind, Gloucester's blind, so he can't see. But even if you're blind and you can't see, can you tell if you're climbing a hill? Yeah. But Gloucester apparently can't. Okay. Um, he thinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. No, it's really, really steep. No, truly. Why, then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes' anguish. In other words, you're all out of sorts because you're sorrowing for your eyes and such. Gosh, is like, you know, sure seems like level ground to me. Right? And so what does Edgar say? No, no, we're at the top of that cliff. I'm looking down over the edge. He's talking about the cliffs of Dover. I'm looking down over the edge. And people down there, he says... Uh, take that back, not people. Crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Okay. The birds look as small as beetles were so high above them. 
The fishermen that walked upon the beach appear like mice. Yon tall, anchoring bark diminished to her cock, her cock a buoy almost too small for sight. So Gloucester says, okay, that's where I want to be. Put me where you are. What's, got, what's Gloucester planning? He's going to jump. Suicide. Why? Because men are to the gods as flies to wanton boys. He's going to F off the gods. He's going to stop the gods from playing with him as a wanton boy. Okay? Let go of my hand. Here, friends, another purse. End of the jewel, well worth the poor man's taking. Fairies and gods prosper it with thee. That is, go thou further off, bid me farewell. So Edgar pretends to move off away. Edgar, why do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it? Okay. So Gloucester is somewhere out here on the stage. All the way up and tells the audience, I'm doing all this to cure him of his despair. Oh, you mighty, this world I do renounce, and in your sight shake patiently my great affliction off. Really? Is he patiently shaking his great affliction off? No, he's not being patient at all. Because what does to be patient mean? To wait it out. To suffer. That's what it means. To suffer. Okay? He's not willing to suffer. Shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer. And not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills. My snuff and loathed part of nature should burn itself out. Okay? If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills. If I, Gloucester, over here, he says, could keep going on and not be in what kind of argument, conflict, war. Okay, that's what that means to quarrel with opposeless wills. Notice what he tells us about the wills of the gods. They cannot be opposed. In a battle between the gods and men, who will always win? The gods. So you can sit there and bang your head against the gods as much as you want. And that wall is always going to be hard. It's never going to give way. Okay? So he says, what? My snuff and loathed part of nature. You've got a gloss there. My spirit. Okay, the loathed part of nature is this stuff. Should what? Burn itself out. Oh, if Edgar lived, bless him. Who's he asking to bless Edgar? The God? Kind of sounds like it. And yet he's just told the gods, essentially, F you, you know, I'm jumping. Oh, by the way, bless my son if he's still alive. You think the previous comments are going to make the gods in any kind of frame of mind to say, oh, well, poor Gloucester, let's help Edgar out. Not likely. And so Gloucester falls. And Edgar... And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. In other words, how can conceit really rob the treasury of life when life itself says, not a robbery, right? If someone comes up to you and asks for something, no, go ahead, take that. You're giving it to them. Had he been where he thought, by this had thought been passed. <clears throat> Alive or dead. And so he yells to Gloucester, Hoa, you, sir, friend, hear you, sir. What are you, sir? Notice he doesn't ask who, and he doesn't ask how. He says, 
Away, let me die. Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down, precipitating, thou shivered like an egg. If you'd been anything other than gossamer, spiderweb, feathers, air, then, because of the great distance you fell, you'd have splat. There'd be nothing left. But thou dost breathe, hast heavy substance, bleedst not, speaks art sound, ten masts at each stacked on top of each other. So, same mast as 50 feet, 500 feet you fell. Make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Thy life's a miracle. Speak again. Gloucester, have I fallen? Or no. I mean, he was either, and I've, I've seen productions done various ways. He's either on his feet and he falls face forward. <laughs> or he's on his knees and he falls face forward. Thinking that his knees are on the edge of the cliff. And you can literally do this. I mean, you can go right up to the edge of cliffs of the cliffs of the Not very smart because the chalk does fall. So you can accidentally play Gloucester and do the real thing. Okay. Have I fallen a note from the dread summit of this chalky bourne? Look up a height. Can't see. I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Notice. Benefit. Is wretchedness de denied the benefit to end itself by death? I mean, if you were to put this in 20th century language, or 21st century language, he's essentially saying, don't I have a right to what I want with my body? Don't I have a right to commit suicide? You know, why is it that sometimes people who attempt to commit suicide get arrested? Nobody wants to clean it up? Okay. Public spectacle? Are all suicides public spectacles? I mean, maybe if they're top of the building saying, hey, look at me, you know, people are going, jump, jump, you know, or on top of pet call or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I wish pet call would commit suicide. I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly 1960s East German architecture, you know. <laughs> Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself? was yet some comfort when misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. It used to be, he is suggesting, some comfort when you had a tyrannical killing yourself because then he couldn't kill you. Edgar, give me your arm. Let me lead you. Can you stand? Yeah, too well, too well. Edgar, this is above all strangeness. Well, what was that thing that parted from you? Uh, a beggar? No, no, it wasn't a beggar. As I stood here below, me thought his eyes were two full moons. Okay. Now, how far away is Edgar saying he was when he saw Gloucester at the top of the cliff? Full ten mats. However high that is, like I said, possibly 500 feet, maybe even only 100 feet, right? And he sees the eyes, he is suggesting, and this other individual as being like two big full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns, a well waved like the enraged sea. It was some fiend. It was a devil that was beside you. The devil was leading you to commit suicide. He is suggesting. Therefore, thou happy father, he doesn't mean father in the literal sense, man, think that the clearest gods who make them on of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. The gloss tells you clearest means purest. So think that the purest gods have done what? They have preserved you. They kept you safe from that fiend that was leading you to your death. 
And for what purpose? To make honors of men's impossibilities. What does that mean? To make honors of men's impossibilities. Laurels or crowns or glories for people who patiently endure, who make them honors. The them isn't referring to the gods. It's the gods of men's impossibilities. It's making honors for the men and women of the impossibilities that they endure. Think about that for a moment. Apply it to some current situation to what happened in Boston. You know, if you've watched the video of the actual explosions and you see some people run away, you see a hell of a lot more people run towards the explosions. You know, especially the first one. You see National Guard guys going, trying to rip those barricades apart so they can get to the people. Okay? What else? What does that mean to make honors of men's impossibilities? If you've seen the one image of the guy in the cowboy hat, help wheelchair. If you've seen the full real image, the guy in the wheelchair is missing the lower part of both legs. All that you see is bone. And the guy in the cowboy hat was at the marathon for what reason? Well, there were people running in memory of his sons, one of whom died in Iraq and the other of whom committed suicide. And as soon as the bomb goes off, he's running towards the bomb rather than away from it. FBI investigated him, by the way. <laughs> Just doing their job. Gloucester. Oh, I remember now. I remember now. Well, in order to remember, what must happen before? You have to know. Or you have to have experienced it. Gloucester is saying, oh yeah, I forgot. But again, in order to forget, there has to be that idea, that memory. He is saying, you're right, the gods, the best gods, the good gods, the purest gods, do those things. Henceforth. And this is where Gloucester really gets his sight back. Henceforth, bear affliction till it do cry out itself. Enough, enough, and die. I'll bear affliction. I'll endure it. I'll carry it. And affliction itself says, that's good. That's enough. What does that enough, enough mean? Like a bottle. Gloucester, at this point, doesn't have a full measure of affliction. He's got, you know, maybe three quarters. So what's he saying? I'll wait till it's full. Okay. Well, he's not going to be the only one who has to endure this. That thing you speak of, I took it for a man. Often it would say, the fiend, the fiend, he led me to that place. Bear free and patient thoughts. Your gloss tells you, free according to Christian and Stoic doctrine. They're the same thing, by the way. Christianity is not Stoicism and vice versa. But what does he mean? Free of despair. Don't despair. Don't give up. Okay? And patient thoughts. Enduring thoughts. And then in comes Lear. So, what has happened to Gloucester? Sum it up. He doesn't love his sons at the beginning of the play. 
kind of implies he doesn't love his sons. And neither does distrust his good son um, and believes the bad son. And then he comes to understand that the good son really was the good son and the bad son really was the bad son. But in the process of understanding that, he loses his eyes. Why? Because he hasn't seen very well with them from the beginning. And when he loses his eyes, he loses his hope. He loses all reason for being and attempts to commit suicide. And then he learns, or to put it another way, he sees that what he saw before And he gets restored. His mind gets restored. He sees properly now, though not with his visual eyes. Okay? And his mind is healed. And what lesson has he learned? Bear patiently the afflictions of life. And in comes Lear. Why? What has Lear apparently never done? Showing any patience. What did his daughter say? He hath ever been rash. He hath ever seldomly known himself. Okay? So Lear comes in. And Edgar says, but who comes here? This dare accommodate his master thus. That is... Gloucester's newly regained senses will not be able to withstand the blow in his present state. Why? Because Gloucester's only been newly healed. If you've just gotten over a major... What's it not a good idea to do? Go around a whole bunch of sick people? If you've just gotten your sanity back, you're hanging around with someone who's crazier than the loon. Like Lear. Okay. Oh, thou side-piercing sight, says Edgar. Okay. Nature's above art in that respect, says Lear. There's your press money. That fellow handles his bow like a crosskeeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace. Okay. You've got all kinds of glasses there. What is Lear doing? Every little thing, I mean, he's the classic example of ADHD on steroids, you know. All oh, things are horrible. Look, a bunny, you know. <laughs> what he's doing is it is showing how, word I put on the board the other day, distracted he is. Every little thing becomes the focus of his mind. Why? Because he lacks focus. So, Gloucester says, I know that voice. Lear, ha! Goneril with a beard! He sees Gloucester, who has a white beard, and Lear goes, Goneril! They flattered me like a dog I had the white hairs in my beard, ere the black ones were there, to say I and no to everything that I said, I and no to, was no good divinity. All right? That is, it was a distorted theology, your boss says. When the rain came to wet me once, and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found him, there I smelt him out. That is, it was in the storm that led to see Reagan and Goneril for what they really were. Okay? Gloucester, I, I know that voice. Is it not the king? I every inch a king. When I do stare, see how the subject quakes. Now, is this a moment of lucidity? Because people who are mad aren't mad necessarily 24-7, 365. They can have moments where they see clearly. See how the subject quakes. I pardon man's life. Is that a power of the king? Yes. What was thy cause? That is... Why were you suffering or were you about to be executed? Adultery? 
Adultery could be a capital offense in Shakespeare's day. Adultery? I'm not going to kill you for adultery. Die for adultery? No! The wind goes to it. I mean, we don't kill the birds because they're adulterous. And the small gilded fly does lecture in my sight. You know, it lands on one fly and it goes to another fly. It's like, disgusting. Get a room somewhere, you know. Let copulation thrive. Let's all get busy. It's kind of what Lear is saying. Okay, but he's going to tell us why. For Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughter's got tween the lawful sheets. Now, is Lear saying that was kind to his father? No. He's drawing a comparison between and Goneril and Reagan. He's just saying Edmund was kinder to his father. And kinder there means both nicer and more natural. Acting in filial duty, essentially. He was more natural to his father than my two daughters. Well, how natural was Edmund to his father? He wanted to kill him. So what does Lear really say? His daughter was worse. Okay. He's not saying Edmund was good. He's saying Edmund was bad. My daughters were worse. And they were conceived how? Through lawful marriage. To it, then. Luxury pell-mell. Why? Because I like soldiers. In other words, men and women, get busy. Why? Because I no longer have 100 knights. And raise me up 100 knights. Behold yon simpering dame. Is this possibly Cordelia? I don't think so. Behold yon simpering dame whose face between her forks presages snow. That minces virtue and does shake the head to hear a pleasure's name. The fit you nor the soiled horse goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist, that is women, down from the waist they are centaurs. They have bestial appetites below the waist. Think of that sonnet 130 about the will. Okay. Uh, lost my place. Beasts shall appetize below the waist like centaurs who have the torsos of men and the bodies of horses. Um, lost my place again. They are centaurs, the women all above, but to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. The girdle here. Everything down below, that belongs to the demons. Right? Remember sonnet um, 127? An expensive spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. How does that sonnet end? Men know what the hell is. That draws them down. Unfortunately, it's not sexual. No, but I mean, he's talking about women and how they're beasts down below. What, is, what does that have to do with his daughters? What does it have to do with the situation? I get his daughters are women. Women, okay. That's his women. Damn them. <laughs> That's kind of it. All the problems of their world go back to women. I mean, we heard that in Chaucer, right? Or we heard it in Sir Down in the Green Knight. You know, if it, Adam wouldn't have screwed up, Samson wouldn't have screwed up, David wouldn't have screwed up, I wouldn't have screwed up. Okay. You know, the little girl thing. So, go ahead. Yeah, it could be that. Well, that's, you know, there... Okay, down below, there's hell. What is hell? A great, big, black, dark, sulfurous opening. <laughs> that is 
down below. Okay? Nice, right. There's now audience is thinking. Okay, put yourself with the groundlings. And there's probably a bunch of guys down there going, yeah, you know, let's go to hell. There's darkness. There is the sulfurous pit. Right? Burning, scalding, stench, consumption. <laughs> so, you know, kind of makes some people go, Shakespeare was obviously gay. Right? No. <laughs> fi, fi, fi. Pa, pa. Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary, that is perfume. Sweeten my imagination. There's money for thee. In other words, clean up my mind. Help me to think better. Help me to imagine better. Now, Keep in mind, first of all, Lear is man. I don't mean angry. He's crazy. All right? But then also, what if the experience of women been within the context solely of the play? We know nothing about his wife. Okay? Would be mad because he had a video with me? Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Civilist causes madness, and what was one of the medicinal cures that they took for syphilis in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance? Mercury. Mercury. <laughs> that's really good. You know, that's like throwing gasoline on a fire. Because mercury goes straight to the brain. Right? He's had one good daughter. What did he do? He kicked her out. Why? Because she didn't flatter him. And he has two bad daughters who kicked him out because they don't love him. Why is it the women's fault? Why is he actually like going on about this when obviously it's all his fault? To give college students paper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's crazy. He's mad. He's, He's, not gonna... He's crazy. He's mad. He's not... He's not thinking clearly. And he never he never has self-reflection, so he's not going to sit down and go, you know, that was a stupid decision. I mean, we've learned that about him. He and he's not going to go, am I being fair to the fair sex? <laughs> <laughs> Do all the men in the play think like Lear? Is Kent? No. Does Edgar? No. Does Gloucester? No. Does Oswald, who knows what Oswald thinks, he's a okay. But when, when feminist critics look at Lear, the play, they solely at Lear. They don't look at anything else within the play other than the negative portrayals of Goddard and Reagan. They seldom really look at Cordelia. They seldom look at Edgar. They seldom look at Kent. Okay? Well, what are you doing when you do that? You're taking one aspect. Yeah, it's the title aspect. Similarly, you could, you know, look at a play from, let's say, race relations. You could look at a Othello and go, it's the black guy who causes all the problems. First of all, he goes and marries a white woman against her father's wishes. It's a typical stereotype because it's essentially rape. From the father's perspective, it is. So you could look at Othello and go, see, that's the problem. But is it like that? No. The problem in Othello isn't Othello. It's Iago. The problem in Lear is largely Lear, but it's also Edmund and Goneril and Reagan and Albany and Cornwall. France, though. How does France view women? He doesn't view them as hell, darkness, stench, consumption, you know. Well, and this, like, super misogynist piece coming from a madman, like, he's not going to be like, oh, 
You're not really trusting what he's saying anyway. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Shakespeare wasn't man. So what this is really this is really Shakespeare's inner belief system coming forth. Nonsense. Gloucester, let me kiss that hand. And then I think one of the greatest lines in all of Shakespeare. Oh, let me wipe it. It smells of mortality. Gloucester says, let me kiss your hand. Why? And he's saying, let me show you appropriate honor and duty. Like, the only problem is, you can't wipe off mortality, can you? How many of you are familiar with Macbeth? Lady Macbeth is always trying to wipe that damn spot out. Out, out, vile spot. And she can't. Okay. That's not her mortality. That's others' mortalities that she's taken. Okay. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Oh, ruined piece of nature. That is, Lear... The ones was up here, the wrong wheel, <laughs> is now down here. This great world shall so wear out to naught. That is, Lear becomes symbolic of the world. This is what's going to happen in the world. It's going to wear out to nothing also. Wow, what a bleak view of life. And King Lear is Shakespeare's bleakest thing he ever wrote. Right? Fortunately, this isn't the last thing he wrote. If this were the last thing, everybody would go, man, Shakespeare had a bad life. Because you get this and then he dies. No, it's not what happens. His last play. Okay? This great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? Lear, I remember thine eyes. Why does he say, I remember your eyes? Because they're not there. He doesn't, he's like, where are they, by the way? <laughs> they used to be blue, but now there's just, blech, you know, dark jelly kind of. Good response. <laughs> Dark jelly oozing down its face. Okay. <laughs> Breakfast, anyone? Dost thou squinny at me? No, do thy worst. <laughs> Sorry. Do thy worst, blind Cupid. See, people usually have this idea of Cupid's out there, and what's he doing? He's got his little bow and arrow, and he's out there looking for people. Cupid's blind as a bat. He's out there with his little bow and arrow going, pew, 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 you know. <laughs> That's why love is blind. It strikes you for reasons you don't know. But in the Middle Ages and in medieval literature, it usually strikes people who are railing against love. There's Troilus and Crusader. Troilus, who falls in love with Crusader. <coughs> Troilus is, make sure I get these right. Troilus is not. Crusader is a Greek. Um, Troilus is this great hero of Troy. Just totally masculine, total warrior, doesn't have time for women. That's not because he has time for men. He doesn't have time for love, sex, and any of that. He just wants to go kill, all right? But it's not only that, because he says love's for sissies. Love's for, love isn't for soldiers. And Cupid comes up right behind him and goes, boom, <laughs> and just nails him. And what happens? He falls in love with an enemy woman, okay? You can read the story about it for your own. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, oh, just don't leave me hanging. <laughs> they all die. It's a Trojan War. <laughs> so, 
do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. Okay? I'll not love. He's just said, come on, Cupid. Take your best shot. Mark but the pinning of it. Now, he's throwing down the gauntlet there. To Cupid. Well, what do you know is going to happen there for? Let me rephrase it. Shakespeare's audience, when they first... Do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. They would all go, oh, oh, oh. Back up. Right here at the front of the stage, we're going to take a step back, because all hell is about to break loose. <laughs> well, what does it happen? Lear his senses and loves. <coughs> Not romantically, not erotically. He falls in love with the daughter who has not stopped loving him. And she does. She goes, you know, just blows his mind again. Okay? So, Gloucester says, hey, even if all your letters were sons, I could not see. All right? So they keep talking, and Lear, oh, are you here with me? No eyes in your head, nor no money in your purse. Your eyes are in heavy case, your purse in the light. Yet you see this world goes. What does he mean, you see how this world goes? You understand. You perceive. Okay? Gloucester, I see it feelingly. Now, he might mean like this. Like when a blind person, you know, that you've never met before asks to feel your face so they can see what you look like. He could mean it that way. He could also mean, no, I see it because I feel the way the world goes in every fiber of my being. But, art mad? Why did Lear say that? Because if you feel in your bones how the world goes, you will go mad. You will lose all proportion. Reason has to stay up on top. Reason has to be able to take a look at everything that occurs. Reason has to be able to be there 20 yards before the finish line at the Boston Marathon in 2013 and see the explosions and and say, it's not the end of the world. Even if your legs are missing, or your arms are missing, or your eight-year-old son's been killed. Okay? Reason has got to be able to make sense out of it. Or maybe not the Boston Marathon. Maybe in West Texas, a little town called West Texas, okay? where last night there was a huge explosion at a fertilizer plant. Watch the video. It's astounding. I mean, it's like a nuclear explosion. You see a fire off in the distance, and then just boom. Hundreds probably dead, they're saying now. Okay. A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. In other words, you don't have to be sighted to understand. Look with thine ears. Is he channeling bottom from a midsummer night's dream? What does he mean with your ears? Listen to how the world goes. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. You know, think Le Miserable. Why does Jean Valjean get sent to jail? He's all alone. He stole a loaf of bread. Why? To feed his family. We had an incident in the United States about three years ago. It was like Victor Hugo come to life. Where a guy went to jail for years. 20 years. I think it was in Alabama for stealing a loaf of bread. Because it was his 
Third crime. 20 years. Let them pay it back. <laughs> Let them pay a hundred times the price of a loaf of bread. But 20 See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Harder, change places. And handy dandy, which is the justice and which is the thief? Okay, anytime you talk about a, an aspect of society like this, I think it's, it's right for then trying to investigate a little deeper and saying, is shit something about the justice system in his own day and age? I think yes. Because you have to remember in that roughly, you know, 100-year period from... 1520 to 1620, or even 1515 to 1615, beginning with Henry VIII and hen ending with James I, you could be for almost nothing. You could be taken off to the tower simply if the king or queen wished it. You were taken to the tower and tortured in ways it, it's almost impossible to imagine. Simply because they said something the king didn't like. You know, it'd be like a comic saying Barack Obama has been haul off to the tower. Rip his ears off. <laughs> You're not going to talk about my ears anymore. I've seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lost his leg. Okay, where are we going with this? And the creature run from the cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. The great image of authority. Well, what's the greatest image of authority? The king. We are talking about a dog's obeyed in office. Thou rascal beetle. And you got a gloss there telling you, telling you what the beetle does. Hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thy bloody lust to use her in that kind for which thou whipst her. In other words, you're beating the whore. You ought to be beating yourself because you want to sleep with that whore. He, Christ says, he that would lust for has already done the deed. He that would think to murder a man has already done the deed. Okay? The usurer hangs the cousiner. That is, the moneylender hangs the petty cheat. Well, which is worse? Through tattered clothes, great vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Okay. If you're poor and you're hungry and you don't have appropriate shelter, blah, 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 Shakespeare says what? It's easy to see vices. But if you're rich or powerful or wealthy, it's hard. When he talks about the furred gowns and robes, he doesn't necessarily mean literal ones. That phrase after your name, member of Congress, senator, judge, police officer, whatever it is, as long as it doesn't say poor, destitute, homeless, needy, okay, then you can cover up your vices. You know, professor. You'd be amazed at the stories I could tell. <laughs> Plate sins with gold. What does that plate mean? Cover them up. Cover them up. Because something that's gold plated isn't gold, right? It could be tin, it could be lead, it could be wood. Then the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. 
arm it in rags. A pygmy's straw does pierce it. And he probably does mean pygmy. No. And their straw, not a lance. You know. None does offend. None, I say none. I'll enable them. That is, I'll enable them. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy seem to see the things thou dost not. There's that appearance versus reality again. Appear to understand. Appear to know even though you're clueless. Edgar, oh, matter and impertinency. Mixed matter that is great, weighty, true. Impertinency, complete madness. Where's the complete madness? Pull my boots off. What? You've just been railing about the injustice of the justice system. Why are you talking about your boots? Because he's crazy. Reason in madness. Same thing Polonius says about Hamlet. Okay. If thou wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Lost her. Thou must be patient. Thou must endure, in other words. Why? Because we came crying hither when we were born. <laughs> Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wail and cry. Now, what is Lear suggesting? Yes, what else? Why, from the moment we... He says, from the first time that we smell the air, we wail and cry. Smell the foulness. We smell the injustice. We smell, smell, <laughs> smell, we smell the rottenness. It's clear for you from Woodbury. And do what? No! Back to the dark, sulfurous, consumptive pit, you know. <laughs> what do we do? We burn up. So why do we wail and cry? Because life here isn't fair. The implication is <laughs> why don't we wail and cry every day? Because thou must, thou must endure. Gloucester, alack, alack the day. The day we were born. It's like Job saying, it would have been better if I'd not been born. But then, of course, God tells Job at the end, who are you to say what would have been better if you'd not been born? You know, just see what Frank Capra does. <laughs> Lear, when we are born, we cry that we have <clears throat> come to this great stage of fools. This is a good block. The meaning is debated. Well, that's a. This is a good block. What's he mean? Often the head is referred to as a block. Is he saying, I, I'm not crazy. I know what I'm talking about. Nobody knows. It were a delicate stratagem to shoo a sh troop of felt. How smart would it be to shoo a troop of horses? With felt. How substantial would felt be for horseshoes? Not very substantial, because that felt would wear away probably within 100 feet. Okay? I'll put it in proof. When we're going upon the son in law's den, oh, now something comes out. Kill, kill, kill. How many are there? One, two, three, four, six of them. <laughs> it's like he wants to kill each son in law three times. Except for friends. So, 
we go on a little bit. They um, take Lear out. And Gloucester and Edmund Edgar are left. And Gloucester says, line 230, You ever gentle gods. Really? <laughs> what did he say to suicide? How do the gods treat people? As flies to wanton boys, they use us for their sport. Suddenly, you ever gentle gods. So what has happened to change in of you? I'll take that back because I just gave it away. What has happened? He's changed his point of view. He's changed but what he thought was the gods wantonly toying with us. He now sees it wasn't. It was the gods doing what? Enabling us to bear patiently what happens. You ever gentle gods, take my breath from me. Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. That is, don't let that bad angel in me. Don't let that dark side of me tempt me to despair. To kill my before you please. Okay? He's just said, it's not up to me to decide when I die. I die when I die. Edgar, well pray you, Father. In other words, well prayed, Dad. <laughs> so Gloucester says, who are you? Came to fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows and pregnant to good pity. That is, he's ready to give forth goody. Give me your hand, I'll lead you to some biting. Hearty thanks. The bounty and the venison, that is the good blessings, to boot in boot, that is, to reward in reward. Okay, now skip a bunch. Go to Act Four, Scene Seven. Cordelia comes in with Lit, with Kent and gentlemen. and she says, "Oh, good Kent, how shall I live and work to match thy goodness?" My life will be too short. Well, what goodness has Kent shown? Yeah. He stayed with Lear. He protected Lear. He guarded Lear. Okay? Ah, don't mention it, ma'am. To be acknowledged is or paid. In other words, you don't need to mention it, literally. Okay? So Cordelia asks about her father. And the gentleman says, he sleeps well. Oh, you kind gods. Cure this great breach in his abused nature. In other words, restore the link in the great chain of being that exists also within Lear himself. Okay? Because what link is missing? Reason. Put that one in its proper place. Everything else will fall into order. Cure this great breach in his abused nature, the untuned and jarring senses. O oh, wind up of this child changed father. He's the way he is because of his children. Not me, the other two. Okay? And your gloss tells you that that's not what it means. Your gloss tells you that child change means he's childlike. I don't think so. Because to be childlike isn't to be crazy. I, I don't think. I mean, I've got four kids. None of, I mean, they might be wacko, but they're not crazy. <laughs> not literally. Okay? Well, my dear father, line 30, restoration, hang thy medicine on my lips and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have and thy reverence made. And she kisses Lear. Lear wakes up in a 
She kisses him. Leah wakes up, and what does he see? The heart. Cordelia. Okay? He sees Cordelia. You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss. Okay. Sleep is a metaphor for death. So when Lear says, you take, do me wrong to take me out of the grave, he's saying, why'd you wake me up? But which sounds better? Why'd you wake me up? Or you do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Because the latter implies almost a resurrection image. Thou art a soul is bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Why bound on a wheel of fire? That's a famous image. A lot of people have written articles and books um, about it. Okay, there was an instrument of torture used by the Spanish Inquisition, in fact, going way back to the Romans, that was a wheel. Okay, and the wheel could be of a variety of materials, one of the ones that the Romans used was a, today we call it a Catherine wheel, had spikes on it. And you would lay a person down on the wheel, you know, essentially like this, with their arms over here and their legs over here, and you have your arms tied and your legs tied, and you pull them. So what happened? Well, as you pull this way, because the wheel is round, round gravity pushes down. And there would obviously be many more spikes. <laughs> and you slowly pull and pull and pull, and the body gets pushed down farther and farther and farther onto the spikes. There was one that was made entirely out of metal that they would heat up. Okay? There's another wheel made out of metal that had a big opening inside, like an oven. You put them on there, and then you still go. kinds of good stuff. <clears throat> and remember, it is for posterity. So, Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. What's he saying? He found my fortune. Okay. Fortune is a wheel. What else? A lot of his torment is self-caused. His own tears, he says, burn him like molten lead. Okay? But it's a wheel of fire. What is the quality of fire? It purifies. It purifies. In tears, Psalm 51 talks about tears of repentance, tears of contrition. Tears of sorrow. Do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. <laughs> Where did you die? He's not quite fully there yet. Cordelia, still far, far wide, that is. His region still down on the 19th hole. <laughs> He's scarce awake. Clear. Where have I been? Where am I? Daylight. I mightily abused. I should die with pity to see another thus. He goes, are these my hands? Hmm, not sure. Well, I feel that pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition. Assured. Well, how are you assured? What's Lear saying? How do I know? And this is a thing he really likes. How do you really know something? Is empirical evidence enough? No. Why not? And they didn't even have Photoshop in Shakespeare's day. <laughs> because can't deceive you. Your ears can't deceive you. You can see something and it not be what you think. Okay. So how do you really know? Cordelia, look upon me, sir, and hold 
benediction over me. No, 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 don't kneel. Do not mock me. I'm a very foolish, fond, old man. Yes! What's he just done? Self-reflection. He's kind of gone, boy, am I an ass. I am the biggest ass the world has ever seen. I am a very foolish, fond. Fond means foolish. I'm a very foolish, foolish old man. Four score and upward. Oh, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I, I, I fear I'm not in my perfect mind. Yes. He's starting to see. I should know you. And yet this man, talking about Kent, I'm doubtful. But you, Cordelia, and so I am. Are your tears wet? Yeah. I pray weep not. If you have poison for me, I'll drink it. Why? Because you have every right to kill me, Lear is suggesting. No, 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 Cordelia says. Am I in France? <laughs> it's almost like he's hoping. No, in your own kingdom, do not abuse me. That is, don't lie to me. Be comforted. Act 5. Now take that back. Very end. Cordelia, will it please your highness to walk? That is, let's get up. Go off for a little constitutional. Why? Exercise helps get the blood flowing. They even knew this in Shakespeare's day. Movement does what? It takes the mind away from itself. Okay. Worst thing you can do if you're depressed Sit your butt down and just do nothing. Best thing you can do is work till your arms feel like they're going to drop off. Okay? You must bear with me. Pray you now forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Act 5, scene 1. We have Edmund and Albany and such. And everybody leaves and Edmund gets a soliloquy. And what does he say? To both these sisters have I sworn my love. I mean, there's just rottenness going all around in this society. Each jealous of the other is the stung are of the adder. Which one do I want? <laughs> both? One? Neither? Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. It's almost like Harry Potter, you know. <laughs> Neither can live while the other survives. Okay? So, to take the widow exasperates, makes mad her sister Goneril. Reagan is the widow. And hardly shall I carry out my side, her husband being alive. So, what should I do? <laughs> okay. Then we get Act 5, Scene 2. Uh, actually, we'll skip Act 5, Scene 2. Look at Act 5, Scene 3 in the folio edition. Okay? Cordelia is speaking to Lear, and then Lear replies. Lear says, no, no, let's go away to prison. Why? Because we'll sing like birds cage. What do birds think when they're in the cage? Do they? They don't. Okay? We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear talk of court news. In other words, as long as we are together in the cage, it'll be like we're free. Okay? But if one of them leaves, then the cage becomes a prison. Why? Because misery loves company. And Lear says, And we'll wear out prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. We'll wear out, we'll endure. All right? All the things that happen as a result of the high and the mighty. Now skip a bunch. And go to... 140 or so. 
Edmund and Edgar duel. Edmund says, you know, I really should find out who you are because you're probably base four. He goes, no, no, I'll tell you soon enough. Okay. And so Edgar says, after he stabs Edmund, just before Edmund dies, uh, let me go back up just a little bit. Edmund says, about line 182, What art thou that hast this fortune on me? That is, who are you that overcame me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. <laughs> if you're noble born, if you have the knight's tale, patents of nobility, then I'll forgive you. But if you're a low born slob, screw you. It's what he means. Edgar, well, then let's exchange charity. I am no, bless, no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. That is, I'm no less born in blood than thou art. Actually, he's more born. Why? Because he's legitimate. My name is Edgar and thy father's son. The gods are just. So we've heard the gods are gentle, the gods are good, the gods are kind. Now the gods are just. And of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. Well, what did Edmund tell us at the beginning of the play? It's not because of the stars. It's not because of the gods that all this stuff happens. It's because of people and their own choices. And so Edgar says, the gods make what? Make instruments to plague us of our vices. In other words, we reap what we sow. What has happened to Lear? He's reaped a lot. Why? He sowed a lot. Okay? The dark and vicious place where thee he got his eyes. That is spoken right, tis true, the wheel has come full circle. Why? Because Edwin started here, he came up here. Only now he dies. <laughs> okay. Uh, skip a bunch again. And go to... Uh, All kinds of people have been dying. Goner and Reagan are brought in. You know, they're dumped on the stage. Okay. And then Lear comes in carrying Cordelia. Howl! Howl! Sorry, Jason. Howl! <laughs> I'm going to grab his heart and say, you know. <laughs> you are men of stones. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead. Blah, 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 blah. What's happened? <laughs> Lear was brought back to sanity. And now the spirit, seemingly, that brought him back Poof, is gone. Kent, is this the promised end? In other words, is it the apocalypse? Is it the day of judgment? Why? Well, it can't get any worse than this. Edgar, or image of that horror. Well, the only problem with an image is what? It's not the real thing. Okay? Oh, uh, Lear, this feather stirs. He's holding a feather down by Cordelia's mouth, and he sees it move. Why? Probably because he's talking. Because <laughs> is Cordelia breathing? Mm -hmm. She's dead. Dead, dead. So what happens to Lear? He dies. Of what? Broken heart. Broken mind. Okay. What's the final straw for Lear? Look at line 328. And my poor fool is hanged. <laughs> no, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? Thou'lt come no more. Pray you undo this, but. Do you see this? Look on her. Look, her lips. Look. Look. And he dies. 
Edgar, he's fainted. Lear, mm, uh, Kent, mm, no. Break heart, I pray thee break. Kent is saying, kill me now, gods. Edgar, look! Because Edgar thinks he sees, this was a medieval renaissance belief, that when somebody died, if you were present with them at their exact moment of death, you would see their soul depart. So Kent says, vex not his, growth, his ghost. That is, don't hold him back. Let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. Why? Has suffered enough. So one of the overarching themes is life is pain, Highness. Princess Bride. <laughs> it's, it's, I can refer to Princess Bride in every class I teach. It's got something for everybody. Okay? That's what that's one of the messages Shakespeare seems to be suggesting. Life is full of pain. Endure it, bear it, then die. Okay? Edgar, he's gone indeed. Kent, the wonder is he hath endured so long. That is, it's, an, um, it's amazing that he was able to live so long. He but usurped his life. Gloss. He kept life longer than he was entitled to. In other words, it's like the gods just couldn't get rid of Lear. He just kept holding on. Albany then speaks to Kent and says, uh, you guys rule. Kent's like, uh-uh, not me. Why? My master calls me. I must not say no. Kent is saying, I'm about to die too. One of the greatest Shakespearean actors of all time, Laurence Olivier, had that as his epitaph. My master calls me, I must not say no. Probably talking about Shakespeare. <laughs> okay. Edgar, the weight of this sad time, we must obey. The gloss says, submit to. It also means endure, accept, speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. What does he mean? Be honest. Really be honest. Really be authentic. Because what we ought to say may not be what we really think or what we really feel. The oldest hath borne most. He's talking about Lear. We that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. And that is essentially, I mean, that is the essence of tragedy right there. To see some bearing horrendous amounts of suffering and going on. That's why, in the last few seconds, that's why Sophocles puts at the end of Oedipus the king, Count no man happy, or count no man joyful till he dies. Because you can't have, according to the idea behind Greek tragedy, you can't have real joy in this world. This world is the preparation for real joy. This world's the stepping off place. Even the Greeks thought. Mothership's going to take off. <laughs> to suffer and endure. Okay, we'll stop there. So, done on whatever day, what it is. Today's Thursday. Done on Tuesday. And we'll probably try to do more than just the flea, the canonization, the valediction, forbidding mourning, and the ecstasy.